Before we get to the climactic, I would say end, but really it's just the beginning. Before we get to the climactic part of the service with the hearing, the, the, the blast of the shofars, I want to share with you, um, um, in fact, if, if you are a gentleman that I've spoken to about blowing the shofar, would you just come up and sit in the shofar section, please? Amen. I want to share with you just a few thoughts again about this incredible day and the meaning of it and, and what Hashem would speak to us in this hour. So I want you to open up in your Bibles to again to the book of, of uh, Breshit, the book of Genesis. And let us look at chapter 22 again. Last night in the, the drosh that I gave, I spoke about what, it, what is it that we would be willing to lay down? What is it that we love so much, like, like Abraham <coughs> loved his son Isaac so much that God said, I want you to bring your son, the one that you love, and offer him on the altar. And so I just want to title this message, Laying on the wood, laying on the wood. Let's pray and ask Hashem to open our eyes of our understanding today. Hashem, we thank you. We thank you, Father, for your grace and your tender mercy to be here. We pray the name of Yeshua that your anointing would be upon us today for understanding. May the words of my mouth and the meditations of my heart be pleasing before you. Hashem, my rock and my redeemer. May it be your will that the light of Yeshua, the light of the living Torah, would bring illumination to my soul. Bashim Yeshua. Amen. Amen. It says in Breshit 22, in the 13th verse, that Abraham, instead of offering his son, raised his eyes and saw, and behold, a ram afterwards was caught in the thicket by its horns. So Abraham went and took the ram and offered it up as an offering instead of his son. And he offered the ram as a whole burnt offering, in fact. The entire animal put on the altar, consumed, and offered up to Hashem. I'm sure that it was a great relief to Abraham that, in fact, he didn't have to sacrifice his son after all. He didn't actually have to die. That he was, able, he was stopped in mid-act by Hashem who said, don't lay a hand on him. I know, I just know by, your, by looking into your heart and perceiving that you were about to slay this, this boy. And as a result of that, I don't want you to actually slay him. I'm going to provide a ram in his place. That's the faith of Abraham. The faith of Abraham is to <clears throat> ascend Mount Moriah, which is the temple mount, and to offer his son on the altar. But I want to I focus today on the faith of Isaac. We talk about the faith of Abraham, and it's one thing to take your son up to the mountain and, and be willing to sacrifice him, but what if you're Isaac, who is on the way to the altar? Now, in many, uh, in, in many Christian texts, there is a, uh, a misnomer that Isaac was a little boy. In fact, as a, as a, as a uh, aside, I was listening one time to one of those Christian uh, Bible CDs, you know, the dramatized version where it says, this is God. You know, those are the good ones. And so... It's talking about the story that we read earlier. Genesis chapter 21 and Genesis chapter 22 are the special readings for Rosh Hashanah. And in Genesis chapter 22, we read about Hagar. We read it this morning. Hagar was sent out into the wilderness. She came to a well, which, by the way, the ancient sages said was the very same place that, that, that was the very same well that followed the children of Israel around. In other words, she was sitting next to Yeshua when she was weeping. That's a whole other lesson. But. So she went out there with her son, Ishmael, and Ishmael was a bar mitzvah. Ishmael was 13 years old. 
He had already been, he'd been circumcised by his father at 13. And so in this, this, this uh, DVD that I was listening to, it's talking about this story. And it, in the background, it says, and her son was crying. And you hear a little baby. Now, I know some 13-year-olds that cry like that. But that's not what they were trying to depict. And so you have the image of this, this mother with her little infant. And it's things like that that, that that really change the whole story. And certainly is the case here. If we believe that Isaac was a little boy, then you kind of have this picture of his dad kind of maybe even forcibly dragging him to the altar, binding him and putting him on the altar. But in fact, that's not what happened. Reading, into, reading between the lines of the story, the, the ancients used to say that in the course of their conversation where Isaac said, I, here's the wood and here's the fire, where is the sacrifice? And, Hashem, and uh, Abraham said, Hashem will provide the sacrifice. And in that discussion, Isaac read between the lines and said, oh, that's me. Now at this time, his father is... is uh, really old, right? Gave birth to Isaac at 100. Isaac is 37 at this point. So do the math. A 37-year-old man could easily take a 137-year-old man out if he wanted to. But Isaac didn't want to. Isaac was willing to lay down on the wood now, according to Judaism, Isaac was actually offered that when the knife came down to his throat, that his soul instantly left his body, went, between, went up to heaven to the Holy of Holies, that it, the real one, not the copy that we have had in the past, but went up to the Holy of Holies and went and stood before the, the wings of the cherubim and the Shekinah glory of God, which is his throne there, spoke to him and said, go back. And he went back to his body. His soul returned to his body. All of this taking place in a split second. And then that's when the, the angel, when Hashem said, don't lay a hand on him. And according to the ancient writings, Jew, the Jewish rabbis believed that even though he didn't physically die, he actually had been offered. And they even went so far to say that the ram that was offered was just like Isaac being offered. This is why when Yeshua is offered for us, it is as if we have been offered, though we weren't physically crucified. This is why the Apostle Shaul could say, I have been crucified with Mashiach. Nevertheless, I live. Not me, but He in me. We must see ourselves as having been physically crucified, but there is only one way to do that, and that's that we've got to be willing to lay down on the wood. We have to be willing not to just give up stuff, like I said last night, and hopes and dreams, but willing to lay our whole life on the altar and say, Hashem, whatever you want from me. There is no, there's nothing holding us back. There's no reason, there's no excuse there's no boss, there's no neighbor, there's no one that can hold me back. There is no influencer, there's no friend, there's no girlfriend or boyfriend or husband or wife that can hold me back from doing what you want to do in my life. This is why Yeshua said, don't think that I came to bring peace. You know, a lot has been said about unity. We need unity in the, in the Guf HaMashiach. Guf is body. So if somebody calls you a goof, say thank you. Gufa Mashiach, the body of Mashiach. We need unity, 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 unity. Unity is only good as long as we are walking in the will of Hashem. It says in our story, in fact, that once Isaac found out that he was going to be the one offered, it says in Genesis 22, 6 through 8, so the two of them walked on together. Isaac spoke to Abraham, his father, and said, My father, and he said, Here am I, my son. He said, Behold the fire and the wood, but where is the lamb for the burnt offering? And Abraham said, 
God will provide for himself the lamb for the burnt offering, my son. And it says, so the two of them walked together. The word yakdav, the root of that word is echad. Yakdav and echad are related. In other words, they walked in perfect unity. One, as the, as the Midrash Rabbah says, they walked in perfect unity. One to slaughter and one to be slaughtered. In other words, you had the father who was willing to offer the son and the son who was willing to be offered. Both of them were walking in unity because both of them were fulfilling God's will for their lives. This is why Yeshua said, not my will, but your will. I'm walking in unity with you. I'm walking in unity with you to the crucifixion stake because I am fulfilling your will for my life. Unity is only possible when we are walking the will of God. This is why Mashiach said, don't think that I came to be, bring unity. I came to bring division. Dividing, dividing family members. Dividing friends. What's he talking about? God, does, does Yeshua want us to be in strife? No. What he's talking about is you're not going to be able to walk in unity with the person next to you if they aren't walking in covenant. Don't be surprised. People are in, are in difficult relationships in their marriage and it just requires a lot of prayer and a lot of amuna and a lot of steadfastness. But you have one spouse who walks the walk and one who doesn't. Don't expect unity. There will only be unity when the, whoever it is, the husband or the wife, gets born again. In the meantime, you just have to pray and, and, and live and live. You live the life that God has called you to live. This is why the, the apostles were teaching the women who had unbelieving husbands, live for God. Don't become secular. That doesn't help. Live for God. There's an interesting midrash about the ram that was offered. It says, The shofar blown at Mount Sinai, or Sinai, when the Torah was given, which, by the way, was the first time the shofar was blown in Scripture. The first time that the shofar is blown in Scripture is in Exodus 19 at the giving of the Torah. And guess who's blowing it? God. And Mashiach tells us in Matthew chapter 24 that at the end of the age, the resurrection will occur and the Son of Man will return by the blast of a shofar. God was the first one to blow the shofar, and He will be the last one to blow the shofar. This is why, by the way, whenever, you'll notice when we have the shofar oath that are sounding, that they, the stanzas are always begun with the tekiah, a great blast, and they end with the tekiah. Everything in between is the crying and the yearning and the longing, but it begins with the, the first shofar blast of victory and it ends with the final shofar blast of the victory. And the very last shofar is the shofar tekiah gadola, which is the great shofar blast. In fact, the rabbi sometimes writes what can seemingly be some crazy things. And the rabbis of old wrote that the shofar confuses Hasatan, curse be he. And one reason that we blow the shofar on Rosh Hashanah and we don't announce, as we normally do, the new moon, when it's going to be exactly, because this is the season of concealment, because the moon is concealed, it literally is the season when no man knows the day or the hour, because we don't know exactly when the new moon will appear. And Hasatan, curse be he, doesn't know either, because he's not God. And when we blow the shofar on Rosh Hashanah, he's confused. He's confused for a lot of different reasons. One reason he's confused is because the shofar represents the voice of God. This is why Yochanan, the revelator, was writing. He said, I heard a voice behind me like the sound of a shofar. He turned around and he described Mashiach. The other reason that he's confused is because he doesn't know the difference between the, the tekiah gadola, the great shofar blast, and the shofar blast of Mashiach. They sound the same. Hasatan is, cursed be he, is thinking to himself, okay, is that Mashiach coming? And he flees. Now, you might be thinking here, that's ridiculous. But I want to share with you a testimony, a, an anecdotal testimony, 
Many, many, many years ago in a galaxy far, far away, I was teaching about the shofar and the meaning of the shofar. There was this lady who, who might have been an angel, I don't know, but she visited the, the congregation and then never saw her again. She came up forward afterwards. She said, I just happened to you know, be here and hear about your testimony, the shofar. I live in Oregon with my son, and we have property on a mountainside in Oregon. And I have a shofar that I got a few years ago, and I will go outside and pray and just blow the shofar. And there's another neighbor of mine who lives a little bit further down the mountain, and he is into witchcraft and sorcery and all that other stuff. And he has a son also. His son and my son are about the same age. She said, my son was at the market and ran into his son. And they got to talking, just chatting. And he said, the the man's son said, by the way, my dad hates it when your mom blows that horn thing. And he said, well, why is that? And he said, well, he said, every time your mom starts blowing that horn thing, it scares the spirits away. And he can't, di- di- uh, what do you call it, divinate or divine, whatever he did, do his little incantations that the spirits get scared. This is why the rabbi said that, that we arouse God's love for us when we blow the shofar because he's so reminded of the Akedah. He's so reminded of the binding of Yeshua his, his, his emotion is so aroused for us that the rabbis say that it, one day the, 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 the Baal Tekia will be blowing the shofar gedola, the Tekia gedola, and while he's in mid-blow, then Mashiach will come when Hashem blows his shofar. And this is why Hazanan says, I'm leaving because that could turn into something really bad for me. So it says here that the shofar that was blown at Mount Sinai was from the ram which had been sacrificed in place of Isaac. The left horn was blown for a shofar at Mount Sinai, and the right horn will be blown to herald the coming of Mashiach. The right horn was larger than the left. And thus concerning the days of Mashiach, it is written in Isaiah 27, 13, on that day a great shofar will be blown. And the rabbis talk about this and say, how is it possible that God blew the horn of the ram? Wasn't the ram offered up in fire? They write about it and say, surely the ram was slain before the foundations of the earth. I'm not making this up. And they said, what happened was, God, are you ready? You're not ready for this. I'm all, no, you're okay. God resurrected the ram. And use the horns to blow the revelation and blow the illumination. We're waiting for that right horn to be blown. This is also why God tells us over and over again and told Joshua, don't go to the left or to the right, but stay between the horns. Don't get off into just Torah observance without Yeshua. And don't get off into Yeshua without Torah observance. Stay between the horns and you'll stay in my covenant. Wow. Wow. Amen. So this is, the, this is the meaning of blowing the shofar. So Isaac goes up to the, to the mountain with his father, walking in unity. Genesis Rabbah 56.3 is commenting on Genesis 22.6. The text says, Abraham took the wood of the burnt offering and, isn't this interesting, laid it on his son. He laid the wood of the offering on his son. And he took his hand, he took in his hand the fire and the knife, and so the two of them walked together. Now picture this. He says, son, I'm I'm giving you the wood for the altar. I'm holding the fire and the knife. You're the one to be offered. You've got to lay down on the wood, and I'm the one holding the instruments that's going to bring the sacrifice. The rabbis of Genesis Rabbah, Midrash Rabbah, comment on this, and they said, it's like one who carries his own crucifixion stake to be executed. I'm not making this up. We see the clear symbolism here 
of Hashem. He says, Abraham said, God will provide for himself the lamb for the burnt offering, my son. And if not, you are the burnt offering, my son. So the two of them walk together, one to slaughter, the other to be slaughtered. Genesis Rabbah 56.4 In fact, the place was called Adonai Yireh, which most English translations, because he said God will provide for himself, most English translations translate it, God will provide. That's an incorrect translation. The correct translation is, God will see. God will see. Yire means see. Yeru Shalayim is a combination of Shalem and Yire. Yire Shalayim, Jerusalem, means God will see Shalom. And Shalom, by the way, is a name of God. Sar Shalom is a title of God. Shalom, I'm not, that's a rabbinic idea. Shalom is one of God's names. And God will look down and he said, I see me. I see what I did. And that's right. I'm bringing shalom to you because I see. According to the rabbis, again, quoting from the Midrash, it says, why does it say God will see? The Lord answers, I see the blood of the Yaqeda of Isaac, as it is said. And Abraham called the name of the place Adonai Yira, the Lord sees. And elsewhere it is said in 1 Chronicles 21, 15, as he was about to destroy, Adonai saw and changed his mind. So what did he see, the rabbis ask? He saw the blood of the Yaqeda, as it is said in Genesis 22, 8, and God will see for himself the lamb. The reason that God turns away punishment from us is because he sees the lamb that was slain for us. And that's what the shofar represents. Among other things, it's a call to say, Hashem, remember the lamb. Going back to the story of Isaac and his father Abraham, they make their trek up to the mountain. And all the while, you can imagine Abraham is wondering, when will God make the substitute and not make me actually go through with this? At what point will Hashem provide for him? He was speaking prophetically. He knew that he and his son would return. He thought even if it were possible, Hashem could raise him from the dead. And it says in the book of, of, of Hebrews chapter 11 that in fact he did, referring to the parable that Isaac was actually killed. And so there they get to the altar and there's the wood. And you can imagine an aging father looking at his full-grown son who was of marrying age. In fact, just after this incident, he gets his wife. Isaac looks at the wood and says, Hashem said me? His father said yes. Hashem said you. And so the story goes in the oral tradition that Isaac willingly laid down on the wood. And he extended his hands and he said, Abba, Tie them tightly, lest I flinch when the knife comes down. And with tears rolling down his face, Abraham took the rope and tied his son's hands as tight as he could. And he said, now, Abba, tie my feet that I shouldn't kick you when the knife comes down. And he took the rope and he bound it around his, his ankles and he tied it as tight as he could. And he began to weep and sob. And then Isaac began to weep and sob. And he said, Abba, don't cry. This is the will of Hashem. And it was at that moment that he raised the knife. And it says in, in the oral tradition that Isaac stretched forth his neck. Can you imagine the amuna that's going on here? And we talk about challenges that we face in keeping God's word. And it's so hard in our modern society. We, we can't go to this place because it's not kosher. We can't wear this. We, we, we oh my goodness, in today's day and age, we, we're not supposed to get tattoos. And everybody's getting a tattoo. They even have tattoo day for pastors. Discount rates and stuff. And it's so hard. It's so hard. It's so hard. But have we actually laid down on the wood? Have we actually stretched forth our neck? Have we actually had the amuna to believe that
that I'm about to be killed, but I know God will raise me up? Are we that father or that son that has that level of amuna? And of course, the rest of the story is that God did provide for himself a ram, the ram of Yeshua. We shouldn't forget, as I mentioned last night, the word Akedah is an interesting word. Isaac, that's another name for him, Akedah. The root word of Akedah is Akod. And it literally means, it's often translated as bound, but it literally means ringed or striped. You see, for the rest of his life, Isaac was known by the marks on his hand and the marks on his feet. He walked around with those burn marks on his hands and feet. He walked around as a living sacrifice. He walked around having laid down on the altar. He was crucified with Mashiach. Nevertheless, he lives. This is why the Apostle Shaul in Romans chapter 12 says, to us, live like a living sacrifice. People should see, as it were, the rings on our hands and our feet. Oh no, we haven't died for ourselves or even died for anybody else. But they should see this one belongs to the Lord. I said last night, the reason that Isaac couldn't leave and go down to Egypt is because he was a holy offering. The reason that we're called for the Torah observance. You know why the real reason is we're called to Torah observance? Every vessel or every offering that is sanctified for use in the temple has special rules regarding it. You just can't use it any old way. Even in our homes, we have the cups for Kiddush. I never use my Kiddush cup for anything other than Yom Tov or Shabbat. It would be sacrilegious for me, God forbid, to invite anyone, young William or Ahmet, over and to pour them a glass of wine in my Kiddush cup on any other day of the week. You know why? Because my Kiddush cup is sanctified for use only for that. And Hashem is looking at you today and saying, don't you understand you've laid down on my altar? Don't you understand that there's rings around your wrist? Yes, I died for you, but the ring symbolizes that you're mine. You can't go to Egypt. You can't dwell in Babylon. You can't leave the holy and go into the profane because you're set apart for something greater. You're, when I look at Yeshua and I see him offered for you, I see you offered if you've been buried with him. This is the meaning of the Akedah. And God is calling us to be the marked ones to be the bound ones. He's calling us to hear the voice of the shofar this year and to heed his call. Yom Kippur is a beautiful, powerful, solemn day. On Yom Kippur, there's no music. There's white and there's reading of Torah and there's prayer and there's tears. Frankly, there's no more moving day than Yom Kippur. But we should not wait till Yom Kippur to pour our heart out to God. He's saying to us, don't delay. Today, if you hear my voice, lay down on the wood and I will lift you up. Hallelujah. I want Amet to come. Who's going to lead us in the calling of the shofar. I'd like for the Hazan to begin, however, with the can cantillation of Tiku, Tiku blessing, and the Hafkadish on it's on page sixty one of the Tikkun b'chodesh shofar b'kese le'yom hagenu ki'choch 
לישראל הוא משפט לאלוהי יעקב. יתקדל ויתקדש שמי רבם מעל מה דברא חירותי וימליך מלכותי בחייכון וביומכון ובחיי דכון בית ישראל בגליו וזמן קרי ואמרו אמן יהא שמי רבא מברך לעלם ולעלמי עלמיה יתברך יתברך וישתבח ויתפאר ויתרומם ויתנשא ויתהדר ויתעלה ויתעלל שמי דקודשם בריחו להילה להילה מכל ברכתה ושירתה תוש בחדה ונחמתה דם איראן בעלמה ואמרו אמן. אמן. As we hear the, prepare to hear the sound of the shofar. Baruch atah Adonai, Eloheinu melech ha'olam, asher kishanu b'mitvotav v'tzivanu, lishmo ko shofar v'shem Yeshua. Amen. And we'd like to ask the cantor if he could recite the shekianu. ברוך אתה אדוני אלוהינו מלך העולם שהחיינו וקיימנו והגיענו לזמן הזה. אמן. Takia. Shavarim Terua. Takia. Takia. Shavarim Terua. Takia. Takia. Shavarim Terua. Takia. May it be your will that the Takia Shavarim Terua Takia bless that we sound be embroidered into the heavenly curtain by the appointed angel, just as you accepted prayers through Eliyahu, who is remembered for good, Yeshua, the Kohen Hagadol, minister of the inner chamber, and the ministering angel. And may you be filled with mercy upon us. Blessed are you, Adonai, master of mercies. Tahia. Shavarim. Takia. Takia. Shavarim. Takia. Takia. Shavarim. Takia. 
May it be your will that from the Tahia, Shevarim Tahia blast that we sound, you fashion a crown of them, that it may ascend and sit upon the head of the God of the legions. And may he do with us a sign for the good. And may you be filled with mercy upon us. Blessed are you, Master of Mercies. Tahia. Terua. Takia. Takia. Terua. Takia. Takia. Terua. Tahia Gadola And so may it be your will, Adonai, our God and the God of our forefathers, that you be invoked by the sound of the shofar, by Tekia, by the Shevarim, by the Terua, by the Tekia, Shevarim, Terua, Tekia, by the Tekia, Shevarim, Tekia, by the Tekia, Terua, Tekia. May it ascend before the throne of your glory and invoke goodness on our behalf to pardon all our sins. B'Shem Yeshua. Amen. 